I think my mission is to help move asymptotically toward the, uh, the appropriate time. So, um, you know, following, a, you know, an interesting little aside I had with Jack at lunch, um, so I'm a data parasite and I admit it. Um, and that's really what risk assessment is. It's, it's a lot of data parasitism. Uh, so I want to talk to you about uh, quantitative microbial risk assessment and its relevance to the built environment. What is QMRA? The two key tests are exposure assessment and dose response. So I'll say something about that. A couple of case studies that we've been done, we've done specifically in the indoor air environment. Um, some speculative thoughts about research areas and needs. And then I've ended the slide with a list of some references, principally from my group, if anybody wants further information. So this is one of the slides I'm not going to read. What is QMRA? Um, Joan Rose in Michigan State and I led a center for about seven or eight years on microbial risk assessment funded by EPA and Department of Homeland Security. One of the um, takeaways and living products of that is a wiki that we set up. And if you want more information about QMRA, just Google QMRA wiki or one word and you'll get the link to the site. Um, that has a wealth of information on various pathogens, various ex exposure routes, and so forth. And since it's a wiki, it's a living document, and anybody who wants to uh, help contribute, let me or let Joan know. So I want to start out by contrasting my take on the difference between microbial risk assessment and epidemiology, and I apologize in advance to stepping on the feet of epidemiologists in the audience. Um, so typically, epidemiology focuses on syndromes, not exclusively, but often. Epidemiology of the exposure variable can be qualitative in nature, descriptive. And then epidemiology tends to have limited power due to size effects unless the effect is greater than about 5% above background, and even that's being generous. QMRA, on the other hand, focuses on individual pathogens often. Uh, the exposure variable is quantitative, and we can estimate low as well as high incremental effects. And we've done QMRAs down to the level of public health interest in various contexts, which is often 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 6 incremental illnesses uh, per year. QMRA is a specialty of risk assessment. And so for those who are not in the risk universe, just a quick um, overview. So one distinction that's very often made, and this is a US-centric definition. There are various other terminologies used in ISO in Europe. In the US, we distinguish between risk analysis and risk assessment. Risk analysis, this is the very broad brush, encompassing risk assessment, risk management, and I actually haven't embedded this in the entire communication piece as well, which is an important overarching um, aspect. And classically, and you know, my friends at the Academy talk about colors, you know, the Red Book tried to make a differentiation between risk assessment and risk management. Um, for a lot of reasons, that proved to be a distinction that was artificial in nature. But the bulk of the technical analysis is in the left-hand circle, the risk assessment circle. The bulk of the quote-unquote soft side is on the right-hand circle, and then they intersect at that intersection point called risk management. So what is dose response assessment? What is exposure assessment? Those are the key questions I'll come to next. Exposure assessment asks what pathogen are we interested in? What is the dose distribution? And risk, and risk assessment tends to focus on distributions. By what route does the exposure occur? Inhalation is certainly a dominant one for what we're talking about here. Fomites are another dominant one, whether um, resulting in exposure by a portal entry in the mouth, the nose, or the eye. Dermal exposure. Um, potentially, there's an ingestion exposure associated especially with young children and PICA, 
um, from dust and so forth in the indoor environment. How often does the exposure occur? Again, a distributional effect. And, you know, particularly in light of the last speaker, I would ask, add to this, you know, who is exposed and when are they exposed? Because that's an aspect of exposure assessment. How do we assess this? We can assess it by direct concentration measurements, dosimetry. We can use indirect concentration, me concentration measurements, the use of some correlation with an indicator of exposure, and I'll come back to that at the very end. Um, we can develop models to assess exposure if we know what the sources might be, if we can estimate fate and transport between the sources and the exposed individual. We can use computational models to estimate the exposure. And then we convolute those concentrations with the intake distribution. How much do you breathe? How much dust do you ingest? Etc. touch frequency, transference, to determine number of organisms per day, for example, that you might be exposed to of a particular pathogen. Again, we like everything to be probabilistic if possible so we can get a measure of both uncertainty and variability. On dose response, if you think about the dynamics of a pathogen once it gets into your body via a portal of entry, from ingestion or inhalation it's retained, from inhalation it may be exhaled, so we need to worry about the exhalation fraction. There's transport in vivo and survival to reach a amenable target from multiplication and colonization. And then there has to be sufficient numbers attained in the body by colonization to elicit an infection or disease response. The modeling concept should take those biological facts into account and consider also that microorganisms are discrete in nature rather than continuous. And when I give this talk amongst chemically oriented risk assessors, I often say, consider when you ingest one organism or inhale one organism, how many moles are you ingesting? one over Avogadro's number. There's no chemical that I'm aware of yet where we're concerned about an exposed dose of one over six times 10 to the 23rd. And so the very fact that we're exposed to those low doses means that there's stochastic variability that occurs in the low dose region that the models have to incorporate. And then we have the concept of birth death once the organism gets into a port of entry, it has a chance of dying before it multiplies, so there's a competitive in vivo process, and the dose response models need to take that into account. And so, and so I'll tell you what that leads to, but I want to be precise with what I mean by dose and response. So the particular dose I'm going to talk about today is the average dose administered to a population. So it's a population a average dose. So if I, if I look at everybody in the room and I release a thousand spores of, you know, Pseudomonas whatchamacallit, and 10% of them are inhaled, so there's an average dose of 10% times 1,000 or 100 organisms divided by the people, so I divide by the people in the room. That's the population average dose. There's a distribution, obviously, of the actual numbers of organisms inhaled by each individual associated with the stochastic variability I talked about, associated with distributions in breathing rates, lung retention, et cetera, et cetera. Then we have the issue of in, in vivo body uh, burden. We can do dose response based on any of those metrics, based on average administered to a population, which is my focus here, based on actual number each individual experiences, based on retained dose, or based on a body burden dose after colonization and multiplication. Response is the proportion of subjects administered a dose who have discernible effects of whatever endpoint we're interested in. Excretion, infection, illness, death, maybe antibody rise. It's quantal, all or none, either you're going to have the response or you're not going to. It's not a graded response. We can also look at that as the probability that a single subject administered a dose 
will exhibit a discernible effect. There are other responses that may be non-quantal. There hasn't been a lot of attention devoted to dose response of non-quantal responses for microorganisms. There's a, there's a developing literature on the chemical side on this, and we need to plow through on the microbial side. So what we know, and this is 30 some odd years now, is taking into account the biological nature of the exposure infection process. The simplest dose response model that's consistent with that is exponential, where D is the population average <clears throat> dose, P is the proportion of subjects that are expected to elicit the response, and K is a parameter that you might call the force of infectivity, but it really represents the probability that a single organism, when it gets through the body, will multiply to elicit an effect. So you can call that a, a success probability, if you will. And for those of you that know the aerobiology literature, you know the Wells-Riley equation. Essentially, the exponential that I use here is somewhat analogous to Wells-Riley um, in that it has the same functional form. Wells-Riley sort of very, in my opinion, and I'm going to step on toes as well, I think, very poorly um, convolutes both the exposure and the dose response into a single equation that makes it difficult to interpret. Now, it turns out for many organisms or many organism-host interactions, there's more variability in the host organism success probability than can be described by a single constant probability response. And so if you do a mixture of the exponential with a, get, with a, with a beta distribution on K, you get to the um, beta Poisson distribution, which is the equation on the bottom. Both of those equations are the same um, limiting form at low dose in that, first of all, they're non-threshold, and second of all, they're low dose linear. So at low dose, there's an arithmetic relationship between exposure and effect. In the indoor air context, what's dose? Well, if you're breathing in this room for a period of time with a time history of air concentration of organisms and your respiration may, rate may be variable, then dose is the integral of concentration times respiration rate for the duration of time that you're exposed to that contaminated environment. We have a large number of dose response data sets. This is just a very short snapshot. Um, not all of these are, are irrelevant, but some are. For example, Legionella, which I'll talk about, Bacillus anthracis, norovirus, coronaviruses, influenza, um, some of the rickettsia as well. What we're missing, you know, I told Joan earlier, we really need more information on the fungi. We haven't devoted a lot of time to fungal dose response, which are obviously key pathogens in the indoor environment. Does this really work? Now, I'm not going to give you a lot of the under-the-hood math, but we looked at Legionella some years ago, and there were a couple of out three outbreaks in Japan. And for any of you who ever have been to Japan in an onsen, these were Japanese onsen outbreaks and Japanese spas. And they actually measured water concentration of Legionella. Um, I'm not sure exactly how they preserved the samples from the initial exposure, but it was reported in these papers, and there are for these three outbreaks, both the clinically reported attack rate as well as our calculated rate using a risk assessment model, taking into account animal dose response data that my student Tom Armstrong developed, water concentration, plus a fate and transport model in the spa environment that we also developed. And there's good concordance. We also looked at the... Um, a Netherlands flower show outbreak with Legionella. Um, there's, there wasn't really a measurement of the water concentration of Legionella in that outbreak, but we were able to back calculate what the range of water concentrations might have been to give the individual attack rates in that outbreak, and they appeared to be reasonable. So this works. We've also demonstrated concordance in a num number of foodborne and, water and uh, waterborne outbreaks as well. Um, second reference that I'll give you from our own work in the indoor air environment is we looked at the question of mycobacterium tuberculosis spread in aircraft. And um, a couple of my students, Mark Nikas and Tim Bartrand, 
developed a Markov chain multi-zonal model if you have a single pathogen emitter on a long air flight to look at exposure. The different traces on the curve are the cumulative time histories of um, exposure to MTB for people sitting in rows distant from the emitter of MTB. And so you could get a total exposure concentration. We didn't have an MTB dose response curve at that time. We now do, and so we're looking at a paper now um, doing a full risk assessment for various uh, MTB, but more importantly, mycobacterium avium complex um, situations. MAC, as some of you may know, is an emerging pathogen that shares a lot of similarity in transmission with Legionella. My takeaway from all this, connecting it to the omics, as I think we've heard today, certainly, and for those of you previously, absolute doses are not currently possible with omics. We expect pathogens to be rare so that they may be underrepresented in the data sets that we have um, on omics of the indoor environment. And there's the issue of viability, which is an underlying elephant in the room. So I asked two questions. Could an ecological epidemiological study be done to assess whether there's some pattern of relative abundance of different uh, characteristics in the omics signal, going back to the multivariate situation, that acts as a predictive indicator of adverse infectious outcomes? Essentially, use an indicator approach. This is how we regulate recreational drinking water quality all over the world. We don't measure pathogens in recreational water. We measure coliforms or enterococci or some other indicator group that would develop from epidemiological correlations. Could this be done with some uh, attempt retrospectively to data dredge the omic data with whatever health data is available? Fungi, again, we know fungi can be infectious pathogens. We need more effort both in deducing quantitative occurrence as well as dose response, uh, data mining, animal models. Um, some references, and did I come close to 15 minutes, Jack? Very good. So we'll hold questions till the end, right? Yeah, that's right. Good.